Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church. As I stand in the sanctuary this morning, I am taking a moment to remember each of you and to think about what it would look like if you were sitting in your usual favorite pews, what the noise would be like during the passing of the peace as you enthusiastically greeted one another. So this morning as we worship, I invite you to take a moment at the start to visualize what it feels like to sit in your pew, to sit in your spot, to think about those saints of the church who are seated around you week after week, and maybe even reach out to those folks you are really missing, passing the peace to. So as we gather for worship this morning, we not only remember our God who is with us, but we also remember our neighbors, the people who would normally be seated around us, and what a blessing they are to each and every one of us as we worship. So on this, the Lord's day, let us worship God. you can find the words printed on your screens. God called Moses to the mountaintop, promising to meet him there. God calls us still and meets us on the mountaintop and in the valley. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord forgives our iniquities and journeys with us in the wilderness. Let us worship our God who does not leave us or forsake us.
So this is our spirit box for the week. There's a special surprise in here and full disclaimer, I already know what's in here. So it's not a surprise for me, but it is a surprise for you. Let's see. This is Paul. Now you all may have seen on the church Facebook page or even in the newsletter or our Instagram that Paul has taken up residence in the church. And isn't that how things go? Paul's a raccoon. And you know, usually when a house gets vacant, some creatures move in. So while you all are not in the building, Paul has moved in, settled in, and he's gonna be posting pictures to our Facebook and our Instagram around the building, the different places where he hangs out. And kids, it's your job to ask your parents to help you look at those pictures and see if you can figure out where in the church building that Paul is hiding. And then there's a special email address, postcards from Paul. And so you'll email in and let them know, let Paul know that you think you found him. And if you guess the right place, Paul will send you something special in the mail. Isn't that fun? So Paul is named after Paul in the Bible. And one of the things to know about Paul is that Paul went on journeys. He went on journeys all over the place, pretty much as far as he could go to try and teach people about Jesus. He was a traveler. So our Paul the raccoon is also a traveler, but of a different sort. He's gonna be traveling around the church building. And I know that he's really looking forward to hearing from you. He hopes that you can find him. And he's really excited to put some things in the mail to you. So. Welcome, Paul. We're really glad you're here. Mary Alice Russell is the one who introduced us to Paul and is uh, managing his correspondence. So we're really grateful to her for that. And Paul, we're glad you're here. Kids, be watching out on our social media for Paul and see if you can find him. Because I know you miss seeing the church building. So Paul's gonna give you glimpses into the spaces that you're not getting into yet, but we hopefully you will be very soon. So we'll see you next week and be on the lookout for Paul. Please join me in a word of prayer. Living and moving God, may we hear your word this morning as a living and moving word, a word that continues to speak even now, a word that continues to call and inspire even now, a word that continues to challenge even now. By your spirit, O oh God, may we hear your word this day and every day. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from Exodus chapter 34, verses 1 through 9 and 29 through 35. Listen now for the word of the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, cut two tablets of stone like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets, which you broke. Be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and do not let anyone be seen throughout all the mountain and do not let flocks or herds graze in front of that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the former ones and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name, the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. He said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. Later, Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. 
but Moses called to them and Aaron and all the teachers, all the leaders of the congregation returned to him and Moses spoke with them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So before I get into the actual content of the sermon, I just wanna sort of alert you to one thing from the reading this morning that I saw in an entirely new light this week, thanks to the year 2020. Y'all, Moses wears a mask. He comes down off the mountain and his face is glowing because of this encounter with God's presence. And so he puts on a veil, a mask, and he wears it all the time in the desert, on the journey. He only takes it when he goes in to speak with the Lord. So let it be said that mask wearing is not new and that it is even biblical. So now we can all just say that we're channeling our inner Moses. He wore a mask because he was glowing with God's presence. And so as I think about all of us putting on our masks as hot and as uncomfortable as they can be in the summer, I'm gonna be thinking about the way that each and every one of us is glowing with God's presence because of what we're doing, because we are doing this uncomfortable thing out of love and care for our neighbors. I can't imagine anything more biblical than that. So set that aside. Now on to the rest of Exodus 34. So if you spend very much time reading the book of Exodus, the whole thing begins to feel a little bit like this roller coaster ride full of highs and lows, high highs and low lows. The people of Israel, they are crying out from oppression in Egypt. God hears them and calls Moses, who will be the one to lead them out. But the Pharaoh refuses to listen. And so there are plagues, frightful, harmful, deadly plagues. But the Pharaoh relents and Moses leads the people out. Then they get into the wilderness and they start to doubt and complain. And so God feeds them, sending manna and quail to assure their doubts. On and on, up and down the roller coaster of the book goes. And as the Israelites move further into the wilderness, the pattern seems to become that God is the source of the highs and the people's mistakes and doubts and complaints are the source of the lows. Now, of course, that oversimplifies things, but you can sort of see the big picture I'm getting it of all these ups and downs. The people make a lot of mistakes as they journey for these 40 years and God remarkably hangs with them. In our text for this morning, it shows Moses going up the mountain to meet God to get this second set of tablets of the Ten Commandments, to try again after the first go at the covenant failed pretty miserably. So our text alludes to it, but you may remember that when Moses went up on the mountain the first time to meet God and to receive these tablets with the Ten Commandments, it's back in Exodus 31 and 32, when Moses goes up on the mountain, he's gone for a while. And the people, they start to get antsy. They start to wonder where he's gone. And as they were overcome by doubts in God's faithful, faithfulness, they made an idol to worship. They made the golden calf. The people, in the absence of Moses' leadership, they made an idol to worship, breaking the Ten Commandments before they even made it down the mountain. So Moses storms down and he slams the tablets on the ground in a really remarkable display of his anger, breaking them apart, breaking the agreement with God that has already been broken with the creation of the golden calf. And so as we see Moses in our verses for today, God is calling him back, back to the mountain another time. 
And this time, unlike before, when God presented Moses with these stone tablets that were carved with the commandments, this time Moses is told to bring his own tablets. This time he has to have a little bit more skin in the game and bring his own. It won't be as easy this time. His work is going to be a little bit harder on behalf of his people. So Moses ascends the mountain alone, tablets freshly carved and in hand, completely separated from his people and ready to bargain on their behalf. And true to God's promise, God meets Moses there. In spite of the mistakes the people have made, in spite of their lapse in judgment, God still arrives. And right off the bat, God reminds Moses of the mercy and graciousness and love and faithfulness that are a part of who God is. Slow to anger and abounding in love, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. I imagine Moses breathing a big sigh of relief when he hears that part. Oh, okay, we're gonna be okay, forgiving sin. We need that after the golden calf. But then we get to the but. But by no means clearing the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the parents on the children and on the children's children. Yikes, not what Moses wants to hear. As God speaks to Moses directly after the people have made this very significant mistake and have moved in the direction of idol worship rather than worshiping God, these words make a few things very clear. God is still a forgiving God. Even now, even after this, God is still loving and gracious and merciful always and forever. But, but for those who cannot be moved, who will not change their ways, who cannot be loyal to the Lord their God, this is where this punishment comes in. God is forgiving up to a point, seems to be the message here. And the easiest way for me to think about this is to think about it in the context of parenting, right? Each of us, as parents, we are attempting to be loving always, gracious and merciful to these children that we adore, but we are also ready for some tough love when bad behavior persists, punishment even. So Moses hears these words, he receives the good news and the bad news, and he responds in a few ways. First, he bows down and he worships God. Then he uses his favor with God to bargain for his people. And this, of course, isn't the first time he's done this and it won't be the last. In his bargaining, he asks for one very big thing. Lord, go with us. Moses knows that the journey is not through for these people and he can already tell that the only way they survive and thrive is if God goes with them. But here's what's interesting to me. So after the people made the golden calf, Moses found himself bargaining with God there too on behalf of the people. And back in chapter 32, he says to God, if only you will forgive their sin, those people, their sin. But here, just a bit later, he says, go with us, pardon our iniquity and our sin. Moses, again, has more skin in the game the second time around. Our sin, our mistakes, instead of just theirs. Moses acknowledges that he is complicit. He is a part of all of this. And although we are a stiff-necked people, God, go with us. Go with us not in spite of our sin, but precisely because of it. It is because of the missteps and the mistakes that we need you to go with us, O God, each and every one of us, even Moses, please go with us. And what is remarkable, even though we know it's coming and we've read it before, is that God says yes. God says yes to the covenant with the people who are still going to be stiff-necked, who have made mistakes and will make more. God says yes and goes with them, even though Moses doesn't come up the mountain to tell God about some great repentance or apology from the people. God says yes, fundamentally, 
because the character of God is to be merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. This is one of those moments in scripture where we see God choose to be in relationship with humankind. And it won't be the first time we see God make that choice. Where we see God choose to reveal God's self to us. Where we see God choose to walk with the people when they and we have not earned it or deserved it. These are powerful truths for the people then and for us now. Because what we see here are people in need of the divine presence, in need of a God who is ready to forgive, in need of a God who will walk even with a stiff-necked people. The work of God in the book of Ex Exodus does not end here. God's actions toward the people of Israel in the book of Exodus, they are extraordinary, but hear this, they are also ordinary because these are the actions that God also takes with each and every one of us each and every day, that God has taken with us, that God will keep taking with us. The God who said yes to going along with the stiff-necked Israelites goes with us, goes with the stiff-necked members of First Pres Virginia Beach, goes with the stiff-necked residents of the Carson household, goes with the stiff-necked Presbyterians and Methodists and Baptists and Catholics and so on. God says yes to going with us, not in spite of our stiff-necks, but precisely because of them. And it is because God chooses to go with a stiff-necked people like us, to dwell among us and within us, to stay with us for the duration of the journey, it is precisely because of that presence that we are able to move into a future that has hope and promise. This is certainly true for the Israelites. It'll say in here in verse 10, God goes with them and will perform marvels. As we move through this particular wilderness we are in, as we pick up our feet and we keep moving forward, on the days it feels like we are trudging and struggling. God goes with us and will perform marvels. God goes with us and will continue to inspire our living, continue to feed us, continue to meet us on the mountaintop and in the valley, continue to meet us where we are and to shine in and through our faces. Friends, the Israelites give me great hope on this roller coaster ride between faithfulness and mistakes of highs and lows and everything in between god chose to stay with them and did not leave them or forsake them surely the same is true for us in the ups and downs of our life and our faith we can trust that as god went with those stiff-necked israelites god is with stiff-necked me and stiff-necked you God chooses to go with us, and I can't imagine news that is better than that. The truth of my life is that when I slow down enough to remember and to notice, I have indeed seen and known God's presence in the highs and in the lows. I have indeed known a God who is with me, who has chosen to go with me, who sometimes even chooses to drag me along in a new and surprising direction. And I have indeed seen and known a God who has forgiven all sorts of my iniquity and transgression and sin. You know, when I lived in the Dominican Republic, when you would leave to go somewhere, even if you were just walking down the street, people would say as a matter of routine, vaya con Dios, go with God. It was a blessing of sorts, a way to wish safety and security for your journey, no matter how short. How short. But I imagine the Israelites would say this in a different way. I imagine they might say, God, go with you. And what a way to bless someone as they go. Go in strength and in courage and in faith because God goes with you. Be bolstered and encouraged because God, because God goes with you. Yes, you, even you, chooses to go with you wherever you go. Friends, God's presence is with us in the wilderness and into the land that flows with milk and honey and everywhere in between. So may we go boldly and may we go without fear. 
God go with you, each and every one of you. Amen. Let us pray. Your word, O God, is a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. There are days when that light seems clear and easy to follow, and others when we feel like we are stumbling in the dark, waiting for somebody to turn the lamp on. No matter where we find ourselves these days, we know that we can put our hope and our trust in you. And so we do our best to feel your presence to find your light, to follow you. And we call on you when we know that we've gotten things wrong. We are endlessly grateful that you go with us on our good days and our bad days, on the days when we get things right, and on the days when we have not been our best selves. And in the midst of a pandemic, with all of the new anxiety and stress and fear that has arisen within us, we give thanks for your presence. We pray for your peace and your calm to descend upon us. And we give thanks for your forgiveness on the days when we are overcome and we have more than we can manage. Gracious and loving God, may we know your grace and may we extend it to others and to ourselves. We know that these are not easy days, O oh God. This morning, we remember the families of Faye Mager and Don DeMuth. We pray for their peace, and we trust that you are with them in their grief. As we remember Faye and Don, 
We give thanks for their lives lived in your presence. And we remember this day all who are hospitalized, who are separated from loved ones, who are facing their own mortality in new ways. May your healing presence be palpable in all the lives that need it, O oh God. We remember those who have lost their jobs, who are fearful of how they will make ends meet, who are adjusting to a new and frightening reality. Help us to see our neighbors and to think creatively about our place in this new world where there are so many in need in new ways all of a sudden. Give us the courage to hear your call to action, O oh God. Gracious and loving God, as we look at the world around us, help us not to lose hope that you are with us. Help us not to lose hope that there is a future for us. Help us not to lose hope for our neighbors in need. May we sense you moving around us and may we find ways to move with you. We pray all of these things and many more in Jesus' name, who is the one who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as always, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing always in the power of the Holy Spirit. And through it all, may you be surrounded by the love of God, who is our creator, redeemer, sustainer, and friend. Amen.